Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Anurag Agarwal. He is um, the Dean of the Trivedi uh, School of Biosciences at Ashoka University. Before this, he was the Director of um, IGIB, or CSIR Institute. Um, he's one of uh, a rare breed of um, medical professionals who were, who were trained uh, medically um, and as, as medical doctors, and now he also does a lot of research. And the research that he does um, incorporates a lot of um, you know, transdisciplinary um, techniques like AI. Um, and he is going to talk today about lung disease and AI applications. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Can you all hear me well? Okay, great. Let me put this away so it doesn't disturb us. What I'm going to talk about is lung disease and applications in AI. And we will start with a very interesting period that tested AI to the fullest. A lot of promises got made, some got filled, and perhaps to my mind, one of the most striking examples of success was when by February, March, 2020, China had built completely automated CT scan processing algorithms to immediately detect presence, likely presence of COVID-19 in symptomatic patients. And what you basically see over here is that it was easier for them to do very large scale CT scans than to offer molecular tests. Contrary to what we imagine, in the beginning of a pandemic, molecular tests still haven't penetrated everywhere. They're still being built. But every place had CT scanners. By creating a, by creating a very streamlined system in which the patient from the time they entered the scanner to automated reading, automated delivery, using their WeChat app ecosystem to even a taxi coming to take them to a hospital <clears throat> to the extent of you know, invasive part, cameras knowing which person has tested positive and who should not be on the street. An entire AI ecosystem was created in China. And what you can see is that, for example, in this case, they always thought the case was negative, but the CNN see some abnormality in this area, which to be very honest, as a previously trained lung doctor, I also cannot see, but this person actually did end up testing positive later. When in a while it goes the opposite direction, a radiologist thought this was an example of somebody with COVID. CNN for some reason didn't. <clears throat> so there will be some degree of false negatives as well. You can very clearly see it's an abnormal CT, and yet the CNN does not light up this area at all. What you also see is these are somewhat understandable AIs where the areas of abnormality are being marked as probability for the presence of COVID-19. So this met most of the criteria. You are using an imaging of the lung that is very likely to be positive during symptomatic. You're doing it at a time when the prior probability of disease is exceedingly high. That's something we'll talk again later on. You are completely automating the system, and you are tying it up to completely digital transform life so that every part of your society gets immediately connected into the response. On the other hand, when we look at chest x-rays, it's an extremely disappointing story. I can tell you as one of the members of the place that was supposed to do certifications for AI for chest x-ray for COVID, nothing worked. We had all kinds of algorithms being submitted to us. But if I took an old data set that contained heart failure, which also contains these infiltrates in the lung, or even if I took things like pleural effusion or TB or anything, false positive would come. The only thing these AI systems were doing were distinguishing normal X-rays from abnormal X-rays. Corresponding to our experience, there's a nice review at Nature Machine Intelligence it talked about how AI for radiographs during COVID, and they took some of the most successful publication algorithms in the world, pretty much selected shortcuts over signal. What are these shortcuts? Sometimes they were as simple as the name of the hospital. If you were to look at explainability, like here, I showed you 
this is the area lighting up. It is the correct area. So you know it's real. Sometimes what you would find is the area lighting up. If you were to build these and you build these by removing parts of the image and seeing what happens to the classification and then creating a heat map corresponding to it. They were on the name of the hospital. So clearly, if you have training data coming from a COVID center and non-COVID data coming from a different center, the AI will find a shortcut. It doesn't need to read the lung. It simply needs to read the name of the center. And that's all it does for the classification. Let me show you how bad it was. These are two of the biggest data sets of chest X-rays during COVID-19. This data set, if the test data set is from the same one, look at the type of AUC amongst the best algorithms in the world. Nearly 100% sensitive, nearly 100% specific. Test it on the data from the other data set, drops drastically, 0.76. 0.76 is in the domain of potentially useful. But 0.76 AUC, let's say I pick a point over here. My false positive rate is 20%. If my action is I do somebody's X-ray and send them to a COVID center, can I do it with a 20% false positive rate? I'll be sending so many guys without COVID into a COVID center. It simply can't be done. And vice versa. Again, same data set, beautiful results. Different data set extremely poor. And these are two of the world's most respected data sets and two of the best publications that came out of it. It simply didn't work. Why is that so? Why is such different experience with CT scans and with X-rays? <clears throat> X-rays are flat images, very hard to make sense. CT scans have a lot more anatomy that is easy to understand for the machine learning system. So while you would pay a radiologist far more money to read a CT scan compared to an X-ray. The reality is reading an X-ray is sometimes infinitely harder than reading a CT scan, at least doing it well. So let's now take a step back. Let's talk about the type of data available to a pulmonary doctor who is dealing with disease. And we have some of the foremost practitioners over here. So if I have forgotten something, feel free to access. But symptoms, sounds, in sounds, you can have breath sounds, cough, speech, a lot of vitals, a lot of physiology, and lots of images. I've highlighted a few of the areas that I thought it was worth talking about, and let's take them one by one. To start with simple symptoms, without using any classical new type of you know, machine learning systems, can you do good old fashioned AI? A basic symptom engine. Yes, you can. This is Ada. It's available for download on your apps. If you were to try it and you were to type symptoms of cough, fever, things like this, it gives you reasonably good advice. It even gives you the most likely diagnosis, tells you what to do next. In fact, the National Health Service of UK was in a pilot study with Ada. And yes, there is a bit of a background now in the newer versions with proper AI, but by and large, it's a complete logical explainable engine. Why it says what it does for every disease, there are symptoms. For symptoms, there are frequencies. You can create a complete Bayesian framework at the end of it. And for those of you interested in trivia, it is based on Ada Lovelace, that some of you might know from history. And the person who is a founder is a descendant of that family. Let's move forward to much more expanded things that we don't fully understand are not as reliable in terms of what they say, but are doing remarkably well. I guess everybody in this room has already played with ChatGPT. If you haven't, you won't be here. So we won't explain what that is, okay? Basically, Rob Morris decided to take 4,000 people in an experiment. We will not even go into the ethics of this experiment. He decided to, under supervision, let ChatGPT, GPT-3 specifically, provide mental health support to people who were dialing in and calling. Short version, he saved time and he got better response. Later on, a variety of sites, including a publication in JAMA, where even a physician panel was asked to rate the responses and empathy. GPT-3 actually scored better on empathy compared to human doctors. And that's already work published in JAMA. But what happened? The minute the patients got to know 
and an AI was answering their questions and telling them, I feel for you, patient satisfaction dropped. Because reality is your doctor might be, you know, not so nice to you, but you would sense as a sense, you're human, they care. A machine saying I care for you really has no meaning to a human being. But doesn't tell you it's that. Let's take a more different, difficult thing. All of you who are doctors, a few of us, would certainly remember the CPC challenge in the NEJM. The New England Journal of Medicine, every issue, every few issues, presents a very complex case. You go through it step by step, you're given the history, the exams, the data, and you're trying to figure it out. When we are in training, if you get, you know, one in five spot on, you're like really happy with yourself. If you even get the right differential in your original differential, you're happy with yourself. So how did GPT do? This is GPT-4 now, by the way. We are no longer speaking of GPT-3. This is how well GPT-4 did. Correct diagnosis in its first differential in 64% of the cases of NEGM CPC. And it could not be read the cases. GPT's training ended in 2021. They only took the cases after 2021. So there was no question of having read the case before. It, the correct diagnosis was its top diagnosis in 40% of the cases, which again is mind boggling. This is the distribution. Five is perfect, three and four are useful, zero and two are not. A couple of the errors that it made would be medical student errors. You would not expect a type of clinician that gets these things right to make these mistakes. But then that is what new generative AI is. We don't fully understand. So we can't really compare in our minds to standards that we already hold. And if you were to take the most cynical view of what a doctor is, a doctor is a person who can clear the doctor exam. That is a really cynical view, but that is practically what it is. So USMLE as a standard, currently GPT-4 gets 90% of the questions correct. Even if you remove the uh, multiple choice options and make it an open-ended, it still does better than most human doctors. That's where we are already. And I have, must say, and I'm, what I'm telling you is purely in the spirit of you know, scientific experimentation to maintain my US medical board certifications, I have to answer these questions every three months or so. And typically when I was on the last day with many questions to go, only for the purpose of you know, doing this experiment for you guys today, I decided to use GPT to help me answer my questions. And it was about as accurate as I was. But if I were to take the intersection of our answers and start trusting it, it's become a bit complicated. It got the stuff right that I might have difficulty with, but ended up missing a few. I was like, damn, how did anybody miss that? And this is basically, many people have done that now for many exams. And this is the performance on USMLE. So how do you see, let's talk about lungs only, diagnosis in this age. The biggest challenge for GPT-4 or any of these is they require the information to be given to them. But who's gonna give them the information? A smart doctor who has already elicited the information already has processed it. We elicit information as we think. So if you're going to require an expert to first elicit the information and then feed it to GPT, you're wasting time. So the only way out is if the problems of a physical patient are converted into accurate digital inputs and prompts with minimal requirement for an expert practitioner. I'm not even using the word doctor here because let's say we do it without any physician assistants or nurse assistants, just a normal person who walks in and follows instructions. That's the type of thing. And then you create blended workflows that leverage the strengths and weaknesses of different AI systems. And you'll get the meaning of what I'm saying in a few little bit. Let's first look at inputs. When I hear somebody's lungs, I'm looking for certain sounds that we call pathological. One of them is called wheezes, which is like whistling sounds. People with asthma make them. One are called crackles. They're like velcros or other rough noises. People with heart failure, interstitial lung disease, lung fibrosis make those. And then there are other sounds that are made by people with effusions or the lack of sounds, or you know, for people with pneumonias, there are a bunch of sounds that you use for diagnosis. 
in a very simple system, it decided to use purely digital stethoscopes and simply have the AI classify all the sounds. And the beautiful part about lung physiology and sound is everything is well-defined. So what you want to know is the Vs, one frequency, multiple frequency, all over the lung, part of the lung, when you breathe in, when you breathe out, early, middle, late, very similar for crackles, fine, of course, and pretty much tying an AI to the output of the digital stethoscope was nearly 100% accurate, nearly. And I can tell you for a fact that if you were to take a physician 25 years out from the initial medical school who does not listen to lungs routinely and put, ask them to listen to the steth for some things, life would not be that easy. I for certain can tell you if I were to listen to heart murmur today, I would be do a terrible job at it. It is not very different for other fields. So the reality, this is a consistent way of getting lung sound, freeing a physician from doing this exam with nearly 100%. And you could, in fact, the other thing that physicians do is because we are busy. I, for example, tend to listen here, here, and I'm done, right? Because this is where all the lobes come together. So you can hear in a few spots, 95% of things. A less busy person could, you know, very carefully make sure that they listen over every possible part and miss less things. Let's take the other thing, cough. And here I'll take a practical example of a paper from India. And it'll show you the challenges and the possibilities. The first thing I would tell you is, and I accept this, a cough is not just a sound. So the paper on the right, for example, entirely uses sensors around the chest looks at the way those things move during a cough and looks at cough in a non-sound way, which apparently is even more reliable because sound can get very complicated between people while the fundamental physiology of a cough can be seen in the chest. But let's come back to sound. And people have already shown that, you know, using cough features, perhaps TB can be diagnosed separately, asthma is a bit different, you know, Almost any of us would identify the irritative cough of a person with a post-nasal drip without even bothering. So yes, we use cough all the time. The productive cough, the dry cough, they're all very classic. Let's take only TB. What they did fundamentally was take cough sounds. They had about 500 people for the training. And you look at the cough in two different ways. One is S frequency grams. Other is as pictures. You can create a frequency spectrum and you can see that over here, this is what they look like. So you extract a variety of features, you create graphs out of them and you use two different types of AI systems. One that is good for looking at a picture and CNNs are particularly good at that. And the other ones, other ANNs that are not looking at the picture, they're looking at more like data and you run the two together, and you can see that there were some things so permitted. And you know, all these heat maps are the usual thing. When they find something that's important and they use it for the classification, it becomes green or yellow in this case. So what you see is different diseases could get classified. You could see different parts of this spectrogram of a cough were important. And this was not an idea that one person has had. In fact, if you look at half AI researchers wanting to work on tuberculosis, half of them are looking at sounds in some form or the other because it's easy. But let's see how it did. And what type of it, oh, I must say, they had one standard design that you will see all over the AI system. You take 80% as training, you take the remaining 20% as test. Go back to the example I showed you for X-rays, how internally consistent data sets are. This creates the first level. Oh, what did I do? So if I had done this in the chest X-ray data sets, my validation would have been perfect, yet it failed completely on a different data set. So this is the first point of distortion of all AI systems in medicine. The fact we call using 20% of the same data set as validation, when correctly speaking, validation must be from an external data set. And what should be called validation, we call pilot clinical studies externally. So how did they do? This was their first one. This was after validation. And this 
was what they've got into the test phase. Now, first of all, when you get into the clinical trial, you should no longer be generating ROCs. You can't use the data that you took to the field and use it to generate one more algorithm. So I would tell you to ignore this. What you should look at is here. Amongst people with TB, 24 people, nine were missed. Now you can spin this any way you want, but the reality is no doctor will ex accept any kind of screening test that misses nine people out of 24 sputum positive proven tuberculosis. So while it was nice publishable work, provide some enthusiasm to the field, a lot more needs to be done. Perhaps rather than using only cough, something else should be added that is easy. That's probably the best way to go because it's very unlikely that cough alone will do it. And in fact, I can see some hints of where they're probably going wrong in this graph. Look at the most similar disease to TB. Which one? Anybody want to speak it out? No, in this one. In this list, which one spectrogram looks the most asthma, right? It is the only other bronchial disease in there. Bronchial tuberculosis, bronchial asthma, both with secretions, both coughing. Obviously, the cough sounds different. And when you get to a village and you start looking at coughing people and you start testing for TB, well, you will find plenty of other people and not everybody with TB has proper bronchial TB with lots of sputum and cough and that's why you miss them. So this is something that when you look at the spectrogram, it starts becoming obvious to you that the bronchial diseases are coming together. But again, it's for the researchers to know what exactly, but when I saw this paper, it was interesting to me. Yeah. The Which one? So the clinicians had that right. Yeah, yeah, clinicians are the gold standard. All of them right. Yeah, yeah. All those 24 are clinically proven. Yes, please. Um, and can I also ask, did they have any kind of basic um, screening for individuals like a questionnaire or five point, no, no. nothing at all? This was a pure cough based, but and you are you absolutely right. Combining that, this with a questionnaire yeah. would be the first thing to do. Because I also, um, just hearing about it, it, it seems like there's um, the potential to bring this into the field almost for a self screen at some point. Yes. Um, and for very under-resourced environments, although it may not be perfect, that may be better than no screen. Absolutely. So like a smartphone-based questionnaire and screen, yeah. So in fact, this would be the best direction I was going to go. Now that you have LLMs with a variety of abilities, you could have the patient themselves feed in all these informations. You could also have them feed coughs. You could run multiple things and bring them together. And that's exactly where I think AI will go in the future. Right now, we have one person building one thing. Now, with the more generative capabilities, we will simply take a huge spectrum of data together and do as much home self-monitoring and self-testing as is possible. And that truly reduces the burden. Then even if you missed eight or nine and they came to the doctor, success has been made. And we will see that in x-rays. So now let me move to a slightly different area, which is physiology. And I'm going to divert quite a bit into some other things that I thought were interesting. So first thing, spirometry is a test in which you breathe all the way in, then you breathe all the way out forcefully. There are only two numbers that I will speak about. One is forced vital capacity, which is max amount of air you blow out after a full breath in. And the second is how much you breathe out in one second, that is expiratory volume in one second. But today we'll be mostly speaking of FTC. The guy who invented the spirometer, and that's disputed of course, called it vital capacity because he saw people who breathed out small volumes died fast. That's the reason he gave it the name. Now, those were the times of tuberculosis. Tuberculosis gives you scarred lungs. Scarred lung will re reduce your volume. So nobody gave that much interest to it. Perhaps, you know, you're picking up people with scarred lungs and they're going to die fast. Anyway, there was no good treatment for tuberculosis those days. As it turns out, even in the Framingham Heart Study from which we got the cholesterol as a risk factor, turned out vital capacity was a stronger risk factor than cholesterol for predicting premature deaths from heart attacks. It was the strongest known individual risk factor in women. So if you had a bunch of otherwise healthy women and you wanted to know which ones are at risk of dying early from a heart attack, just do a spirometry, get an FEC, FEC will give you the answer. 10% reduction in 
FVC corresponds to 30% increase in your risk of a premature death. And this is all cause mortality, not only heart attack. The other disease that it is predictor of is diabetes. So people with low FVC are at very high risk of get developing diabetes. That's the other thing that is. And who has the worst FVC in this world? That's there in this graph, Indians. Indians have 30% lower FVC for the same height, weight, gender, socioeconomic status compared to a white American or European. All the major incest areas of the world are shown over here. Indians are by far the worst. What do we do? We call our local FVC normal. Is it normal? Maybe, maybe not. We do seem to have high risk of dying early of heart disease. We do seem to have a high risk of developing diabetes. So perhaps it's telling us something that is worth exploring further. And children of Indian parents who moved to America before their kids were born, their children have FVC intermediate between white Americans and their parents. So clearly it's not all genetic. And I'll come to some interesting data on that soon. I'll not tell you too much except that we did the study in North India and South India. We found that South Indians had a lower lung function. We saw that it also declines faster with time on a Z-score basis, so it's not normal. If it was a healthy smaller lung after converting to Z-scores across ages, it should be a straight line. But if your Z-score keeps declining as you get older, well, it's not normal. So we did a study to ask how soon it occurs, and we decided to look all over India. We looked at adolescents from class nine to class 12. We went to Jawahar Navadha Vidyalaya schools. These schools are boarding schools where kids live for the entire year. And we went to many of them across India. You can see the multiplicity of sites. And basically two and a half thousand kids were studied. And I will not get into too much detail, but we saw two, three important trends. Children from South India had lower B vital FEC compared to children from North India. And this is the more polluted part of the country. This is the less polluted part of the country. This is the richer part of the country. That's the poorer part of the country. And children who were what we tend to call tibeto burman origin. Uh, you could also call them closer to Chinese genetic populations. Had higher lung function than even North Indians. Within them, those who were taken from Leh had clearly the highest lung function of them all. But we decided to ignore it because that could simply be high altitude adaptation. What we did is to ask what is driving poor lung function in India. And this is where machine learning and the relevance to today's talk came in. Because you can use it not only for diagnosis. You can use machine learning in lung disease to better understand things. And what we could do is we could identify them into two clusters that we saw all over the country. These were seen in North India also. They were seen in South India as well. And they were also seen in Tibeto Burma. Tibeto Burma had the smallest part of this particular cluster. South India, North India was about the same. What we could see is that, and these, I want you to look at cluster one, blue. Their Z score for vital capacity is much lower. But see the associated parameters. Their waist to height ratio is much smaller. They are thin kids. And these are boarding school kids, unrestricted diets. They're all from very similar socioeconomic backgrounds. But for some reason, these kids are thin. Their inflammatory cytokines are through the roof. Interleukin-17, interleukin-8, TNF-alpha, interferon. So these are kids who are thin, have high levels of inflammation. And on the symptom questionnaire, they complain of GI symptoms. They have a preponderance of GI symptoms. I have no great idea what this is, but I'm guessing all of us can guess it. It's probably dysbiosis, chronic gut infections, poor sanitation. And these things are not necessarily that different in that socioeconomic strata between any part of the country. So it brings to point that within phenotypes, there may be genetic components which are not relevant. We're all very similar at the end of the day and fixable environmental components. It's really complicated, and you can use machine learning and data science to get greater insights, which are only hypothesis generating, and then formally go out there and test these ideas. So because of excellent work done by Dr. Mohan in creating a cohort called CARS, which 
as adults from North India and South India. We hope to do these kinds of lung function work further and try to explore this a bit more. Earlier, we used to say every region should have its own lung function. Then me and many others argued very hard and said that's wrong. So earlier this year, we have gone completely the opposite direction. Now everybody will be compared only to white Europeans as the best lung function in the world. That might be a bit too far. Indians might be a very good place to look at the blend of European with an ancestral population. I know that's controversial, but we can dissect this out very well in India. The other thing that we noticed, and I'm going to move to a second test now, is that these people with poor lungs may also have airway disease. The other reason you can't blow out all the way very nicely is because you have airway disease. And there is a tool called oscillometry, and I'll explain that to you in a little bit, um, that confirmed our idea in the cohort that we have in Delhi, that small lungs, even if it is not showing obstruction on spirometry, probably has the beginning of airway disease. And this is uh, Mohit Agarwal who led the study that I described previously, and now we'll move to a different set of people. The basic idea of oscillometry is, I'll take you back to your physics days, electronics. If you had a circuit with an inductor and a capacitor and a resistor, and you had to solve the circuit, what would you do? You would give a varying frequency sinusoidal voltage. At some point, the capacitor and the inductor would cancel each other out, leaving you with a resistor. You would know that because the phase would become identical. And then you could go backward and start solving things. We do exactly the same thing for the lung. Imagine the inertia of the air in the lung as an inductor. It hates being accelerated. Imagine the elastance of the lung as being able to store and give back. That's like a capacitor. And a pressure wave can be added as a person breathes at a frequency that is completely distinguishable from the breathing frequency. And then you can use mathematics to calculate what is called impedance. Now, impedance, not any time these parameters, they will have a phase shift. So impedance can be split into a part that is in phase with the pressure wave, that is resistance, and out of phase with the pressure wave, that is called reactance. And then you can find the resonant frequency, then you can solve it. That's roughly what it is. We won't, if only for those of you interested in this, we'll go forward, but this is the basic idea. So what we did is we looked at what are the problems today? First, these kinds of devices are very, very non-portable. These are three standard commercial devices. The smallest is the size of your head. And data interpretation remains a challenge. You know, you create these many mathematical variables for understanding, yet most doctors don't understand it. So you might be even better off not creating these things and simply using ML to analyze a large amount of this time series data. So I don't know if Tarpitesh is here in the room. He has spoken to you before. So when Tarpitesh was a PhD student in my lab, he decided to look at time series data coming out of an oscillometer in people. We found the averages are nice, but the values are very noisy. That's what a normal person's resistance looked like. This is what an asthmatic looked like. If I take the average, these are identical, almost identical. You cannot separate them. But if I were to filter them for breathing frequency associated change, that's what the normal person looks like. That's what the asthmatic person looks like. That's very easy to tell, right? Just by looking at it. Why? Because asthmatic's airways may be collapsing and opening. So every time the person breathes out and in, even during normal respiration, a small blip comes in the resistance. That small blip is hidden in the noise, but is extracted by mathematics, making it visible. So we were originally going to publish this paper and uh, using this parameter that we called uh, volume dependence, I think, we created a beautiful way to, of diagnosing asthma. I'll show you how good it was. So basically green is an asthmatic after treatment. Uh, no, blue is an asthmatic after treatment, red is an asthmatic during an attack and green is a normal person. On the left, we have our new parameter. Here we have standard oscillometry. Here we have spirometry. What I want you to see is it's all mixed up using the other methods. Trouble with using PFT to diagnose asthma is in between attacks. Asthmatics are almost normal. 
But even when the asthmatic is normal, the blue over here, this new parameter could detect them beautifully. So we were on the way of building our own oscillometer and then, you know, you know, incorporating these algorithms as a patented item and so on. And we got some money from the US India Tech Endowment Forum, but a small problem came. This entire pathway of giving impulses and then sorting out is already under IPR of somebody else. So there is open source and there is not, and then you have to work according. And again, you can use machine learning to pick out the most inform informative ones. I'm gonna skip past this. I will point out this. this is the young Dr. Taprite Sethi getting the innovators under 35 award MIT Tech Review from India. And then of course, this is work we continue another PhD student looking at ability of using such indices to predict exacerbations in children presenting to the AIMS clinic. So can you predict an exacerbation before it occurs? But I'm gonna move forward to what happened. Let me go forward a bit and I'll come back to this. Okay. I should have put this one slide next. So this is the device that we finally end up building. It's called the Palmo scan. It's a new oscillometer that just got FDA approval, but it doesn't use impulses. It uses multi-frequency sine waves, uh, which require less power compared to a sharp impulse. Now, the more power you want to put into it, the bigger you need to make it. If you want to create a battery operated portable device, well, then you have to be more gentle. So this within 10 breaths will do everything that we can. We are not designing it for asthma because asthma diagnosis is not really a VFT problem, but we are using it for COPD exacerbations. Now in COPD, and I know I've thrown a word at you that I didn't explain to you, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, a lot of the small airways in the lung have been damaged. And these people are going to decline. Already we can see that an Indian 50, 60 year old has lungs like a 60, 70 year old outside. And every time these people have an exacerbation, they lose lung. And lost lung doesn't come back. So the basic idea is, can you predict an exacerbation? Treat in a timely manner. It is the biggest challenge in the field of COPD. I will show you some early data where people take these devices to their own houses and start just breathing quietly into it for five to 10 breaths every day. These are all composite parameters. Now there is no R5, X5, resistance, reactance. It is simply machine learned parameters which are dimensionally condensed to make it easy. What I want you to see is this vertical line is when this patient has an exacerbation based on symptoms. And I want you to see how the baseline goes significantly from minus 0.2 to almost 0.2, even before the person became symptomatic and declared. So basically you could have detected the exacerbation almost seven to 10 days before it happened, if the person was using it on a daily basis. This is work done with Cognita Labs, my partner in the US. It was recently presented at ATS 2023. It's all in the public domain. This is if we use a symptom questionnaire the standard questionnaire used by all people in the field. What you can see is, while you can see a slight trend coming, it never really reaches significance in a group of about 15 patients or so. And so it's not very helpful. And obviously it makes sense, right? I mean, only when most of them felt the symptoms, we call it an exacerbation. That's when they decided. So these are the types of possibilities. We were probably barking up the wrong tree with asthma possibly because my area of research has been asthma, but COPD is where the value of this kind of a machine learning, physics, oscillometry, all combines into. Now let's get back to the other type of data, that of molecular endotypes. All these words are heterogeneous. In 1950, COPD included asthma, bronchiectasis, what is currently called COPD, and post-tubercular bronchiectasis. Today, all these words are separate. Why are they separate? Because now we have different treatments. In 1950, we only had one treatment for all the four diseases. So we called all the four diseases one disease. This tells you never to trust current medical nomenclature as a final gold standard. We use the nomenclature to come up with new treatments. And when we come up with new treatment, we change the nomenclature. And this is something that will keep on going. So be careful in how you look at data. And always be inquisitive regarding trying to find something new. It hasn't been seen yet. 
So in asthma, we were doing NMR spectroscopy of the condensate of your breath. So if you were to breathe against a cold surface, fluid coming out of your lungs will condense. It's called exhaled breath condensate. We were doing NMR spectroscopy of this condensate to see differences. Just by our eye, we could see a very nice difference between asthmatics and normal people. And this happened to be a triplet peak that we had a great chemist working with us. He could just look at it and tell us it was ammonia. He knew it. That's not really the issue. And it came, led to a successful paper because, you know, something that's this obvious worked well. Problem is, how do you deal with all this? You can keep expanding it as much as you want. The only way to look at it is to actually go into machine again. And this is exactly what Kaundinya Desi Raju did as another PhD student of the lab. And I think Kaundi will also be speaking to you about later on in this seminar. So basically he looked at all possible peaks and the information they contained in discriminating people. And this time again, we opened ourselves to the idea that asthma is not one disease. There might be many subtypes hidden below it. And we were of course glad to see that what we could see with our eye also came out from machine learning. It would have been very, very suspicious if it didn't. Not really a finding, but glad to see this triplet peak of 6.9, 6.95 and 7 came up. But we could now divide these asthmatics into clusters. And they had very different clinical properties, which mapped, and this is just proof of that uh, ammonium idea molecularly, which mapped very nicely into data coming from around the world on there being a type of asthma that had a lot of symptoms but very little allergy, a type of asthma with lots of allergy but very little symptom, and a type of asthma which had symptoms and allergy in proportion. These corresponded very nicely to the type three subgroups we could see within our group from NMR of the breath condensate. And again, you can expect that each of these would have a different set of molecules, and that's why we see it. Again, this type of work needs to be done at scale. I am saying again, almost everything that comes out of it is only hypothesis generating. Then needs to be tested again. This I already discussed with you. Good point to ask you this question, whether you're feeling sleepy. And if you are so, AI helps. One of the commonest problems is that of obstructive sleep apnea. In fact, people who do both sleep and pulmonary effectively end up concentrating on the sleep part of their career. It is far more innovative. A bit boring because of AI. So what typically happens is that for many of us, either because of weight gain or even without weight gain, the muscles have become loose. And in night when we are asleep, the upper airway closes. So you are struggling to take a breath. You're not actually breathing. Then your brain wakes up. Because your brain wakes up, the muscle tighten up again. Airway opens, you can breathe. So you may end up waking up 50, 100 times in a night. So you would wake up feeling very non-refreshed and you would be a lot of sleepiness during the day. Very common problem, very underdiagnosed in India. Be aware of it. So what we do to diagnose it is something called a sleep study. So we put sensors everywhere from your jaw muscles to your eye muscles because you're looking at stages of sleep, to electrodes on your head, to things on your body to measure your diaphragm is moving, your chest is expanding, your abdomen is moving. And a typical record can look something like this. Okay. Once upon a time, sleep studies were expensive and difficult and specialized because sleep specialists with a license to read these studies would have to look at them very carefully. Today, it looks like this. This is actually how AI puts it. Arousal happening over here, hypopnea happening over here. You can see airflow went down, chest kept moving in the beginning. Almost everything is automated. Very reliable, epoch by epoch. So we call each duration an epoch. Nearly 100% accuracy. I, for the life of me, can't know any sleep specialist friend of mine who really does it manually anymore. I mean, you bill for it, like a complex procedure should be built, and putting all these electrodes on the patient, keeping them in the night costs money. But this is how much AI has completely changed the field of sleep medicine. But now, what was making my sleep specialist friends happy is starting to make them unhappy. Using AI, it is possible with about 90% accuracy, 80 to 90% accuracy to even use an actigraph, a motion thing in the night, a smartwatch, a snoring recorder, a breath sound recorder in the night to diagnose the same thing. So what made life easy for a while 
is now leading to a loss of business with people many times getting diagnosed by this, but not too much loss of business because in the end, they have to have a treatment. The treatment is you put positive pressure into the lungs to kind of splint the airways open. For that, you're going to have to go back to the sleep lab and they are going to have to do the study. So, so far, as long as treatment remains, AI cannot displace doctors. <laughs> Let's move to images. As I said earlier, images are the most suitable things for AI. I was very pleased to see this particular paper. There is something called clubbing. In clubbing, your fingers look like this. And there are all kinds of things that cause clubbing, including lung cancer. In fact, each letter of the word clubbing stands for a different thing in the lung. And Dr. Bowen is laughing because we all remember that mnemonic very nicely in our initial years. But I had Terrible difficulty, you know, looking at fingers and telling whether they were clubbed or not, especially on the early stage. You're supposed to look at the angle. This angle is what you're supposed to look at. And I must say it was tough. You know, periodically, as in young medical student, you get overexcited. I think I found a case of lung cancer. See, there is a clubbing on the finger. So AI can help you with the club. That's the low end of it. Um, I don't think most doctors will use it today, but it's still interesting. It can be done. And of course, at the other extreme end, on a biopsy, on a lung sample, they can do all kinds of cytologies better than humans can today. Let's come back to chest x-ray. Let's come back to a very interesting disease, tuberculosis, all over again. The entire interest in AI in chest x-ray got greatly accelerated by a program called CAD4TB, Computer Assisted Diagnosis for Tuberculosis by a university in Netherlands, then tying up with a company called Delft, and people in Africa who had lots of tuberculosis during the HIV times, well, still do, and not enough doctors to diagnose. So it was just running rampant. What together they created were clinics and boxes like this. There is no doctor. You just walk in, your x-ray is done, it is read, and Positives are certain, negatives are certain, something in the middle gets sent to a human doctor somewhere else. This is now at version six. Now it works on uh, small children, it works on adults. But they had a miserable coming to India. They tested in Rawalpindi, Pakistan, and were just hit with false positives. And actually, this is the typical problem with AI. In India, we have what are called dirty lungs. And there is no better way to describe it, but they are just dirty looking compared to clean looking lungs outside. Now in Africa, where people had otherwise cleaner lungs, these dirty lungs were a sign of tuberculosis. In India, they're a sign of nothing. That's just the background subtraction that you do mentally if you're used to looking at images here. So they had to retrain using Indian data sets to get it to work. Meanwhile, Indian companies like Cure AI have probably produced a better product than them. So today in 10 rupees, I think the government of India is paying them 10 rupees, your X-ray can be completely automatically read. And they are comparable to human radiologists for specific applications. But the problem is specific applications are tough. A person does not, well, TB is a unique case where people come specifically for a TB referral. But in general, people come for shortness of breath or you know pain somewhere or something else. And they could have one of 25 diseases. What are you going to do? So what we now can see is AIs are better than at least third-year radiology residents and probably even as good or better than thoracic radiologists in finding findings in an X-ray. Interpreting is a different issue. If you only were to speak of can we find findings, they're better. So in this paper in Lancet in 2021, using 124 clinical findings that can be described on an X-ray, in 117 of them, the model was non-inferior to radiologists. No, actually superior. In 117 out of 124, it was better than a radiologist. In seven out of 124, it was non-inferior. That's how much better uh, AI is compared to a human eye. Making sense of the findings, that's the next question, right? And that's again goes back to the same type of things you are discussing. Now that we have LLMs, what they require are inputs. Can we go from providing these inputs, the findings, into those systems? We know they can solve any GMCPC. In fact, in EU, they have already now allowed autonomous X-ray systems. These are approved. No human will look at your report before it is sent to you. Only for a normal thing. 
because they are so much better at finding abnormalities. If the AI says it's normal, it's normal. So in this specific interpretation of just X-rays featuring no abnormality, Occipit, an EU-based company, has been given certification and billing rights to read those X-rays and it can charge money. So it's quite interesting. It saves time. Very similar work was already happening in Africa, but then we always used to think, well, because poor Africans have no option, that's why we are doing it like this. But now this is Europe. America is also giving these kinds of approvals now. I don't know when India will follow, but clearly, this is the way of the future. And this is something I already mentioned to you. Findings are different from diagnosis. Diagnosis is a Bayesian concept. You must have local prior probabilities, patient-specific context in place to make a diagnosis. You can't just use findings. Every doctor knows that intuitively. Treatment is even more context dependent. For exactly the same diagnosis, people from different socioeconomic strata might ethically be given different answers. There's nothing wrong in it. It's not America where everybody will be billed only through insurance. So I don't see diagnosis and treatment. Diagnosis will go first, but treatment will remain in the hands of physicians for time to come, at least in lung disease. And there are many things that are troublesome about AI. Opacity, hidden stratification. I'll give you a very nice example of this. People built a wonderful AI to diagnose pneumothorax where air is there in your lung. This air is always there in the lung. It has come out of the lungs and into the surrounding cavity. It turned out it wasn't looking at the air, looking at the tube that we put after we find the air. So every time somebody has free air outside the main lung, we have to put in a tube to drain it. The AI was reading the tube to make the diagnosis as opposed to uh, seeing the pneumothorax. So these are hidden stratification that you don't come to. And I'll give you more examples when we come to data governance later. So how can we put it together? You need foundational AI with verifiable grounding of systems. Explainability must be there, especially if you're going towards diagnostics. You can combine, for example, an LLM with a computer vision for X-ray feature findings, right? You could do that. Already somebody has done it. It's called X-ray GPT. HS radiographs summarizing using large language models. Another one called LavaMed. These things are happening now. I mean, it's just brilliant. I mean, you go to their archive paper. They will give you a full day. You can talk to them. Do you think there is congestive heart failure findings here? No, there are no congestive heart failure findings. I mean, you're talking for an X-ray that you have submitted. That brings me to the end, and I'm very, very open to questions. This is the other reason, very, very pragmatic and cynical reason why doctors are not going away anytime soon. Somebody needs to take responsibility for what you say. I'm very certain the AI companies won't. I want to take two more minutes to tell you about this new fellowship that has been started at Ashoka. It's called the Simon Ashoka Early Career Fellowship in Quantitative Biomedical Sciences. It is designed particularly for people outside the field of biology, CS, maths, et cetera, to come towards biomedical sciences to do quantitative work. It is funded by the Simons Foundation in America. Jim Simons is the person, he's a mathematician, who started quantitative trading on Wall Street. And he remains convinced that quantitative people add value wherever they go. So he creates these kinds of fellowships. You might have heard about the Simon Center, um, Living Machines at NCBS, some of you, but yes. So would love to have this crowd, perhaps look at this program on our website and happy to take any questions. Hi, nice talk. So uh, I just had one question. Uh, you said that people from Ladakh, they have relatively greater lung function uh, considering the low oxygen pressure in that area. So I was interested, is it genetics which plays a role there? So we have previously worked on this. The genetics of Ladakh is quite different from genetics of lowlanders. In fact, genetics of highlanders in Ladakh is different from Chinese population at low, land, low altitude. They're, one of the areas of difference is in the hypoxia-inducible factor pathways. So the degrading enzyme called EGLN1, that's work that came out of 
my former institute as well as from China. So there are fundamental genetic differences, which is why we didn't put too much emphasis on that one. Yeah, then in that case, probably like generalizing North India, having this, I said. because in North India, we have Ladakh, then we have Delhi. I mean, very close. I mean, even Jammu yeah, is very complete. close. So these alleles are complete. And these two populations will have different uh, cardiopulmonary function, considering the altitude they live in. One is like very high altitude Ladakhis, Ladakhi people. And then we have Jammu, which is around 300 kilometer from that region. And it is in low land. So this is a unique thing only found in two highland population. Yeah. The same mutations have been found in Andes. The same in Ladakh, uh, same in Tibet. So, but they are not found in the similar genetic background lowland population. Yeah. So, a science paper from China looked at Chinese people who lived lower down and the ones who were ancestrally further up. Mm -hmm. So, this does not explain the larger gradient. The larger gradients are separate from this. And also, if I were to completely remove Ladakh, yeah, and even then there's a different gradient. And also, if we see South India. We have Western Ghats, which are very high altitude, and there are places which fall there. Then low altitude regions like the, the I mean, point Chennai or uh, Mangalore. Yeah. From an oxygen physiology point of view, there is no difference between lowland and the Ghats. Oxygen physiology only comes into play at two high altitudes, which contain levels of oxygen insufficient to maintain 90% plus saturations on room air. As long as you're doing 90% see, every time you exercise, your O2 sats varies, right? So the ability to maintain sats as a function of atmospheric oxygen really changes only after a certain level of O2 is reached. That does not occur at, so for example, Denver it will occur, Andes it will occur, Tibet it will occur, but not even in Jammu, not high enough to bring that part of physiology into play. So huge amount of work. So if you type high altitude pulmonary edema, genomics, genetics, and all those things, you will see there is nothing called HAPE in any of the other places. HAPE is very localized to extreme high altitude only. Any more questions? If not, let's all right. thank, thank you all very much. <laughs>